Zuko took a deep breath and tightened his grip on the iceberg. He had carefully placed his long, curved body around the peak, front legs gripping one side while hind legs gripped the other, dividing his weight as evenly as he could, so as not to accidentally topple the thing over. These precautions appeared to be unnecessary. However, despite Zuko's increased body mass, the enormous flowing chunk of ice didn't so much as sway under his weight. Uncle had told the French years ago, when they'd been searching the South Pole for the Avatar the first time, that the part of the iceberg you could see above the water was only a fraction of its true mass. From a sailor's perspective, this meant keeping a respectful distance to the deceptively calm-looking floats. Although fire ships were built to endure direct hits with ice sheets, even they weren't unbreakable, and no one really wanted to risk a shipwreck in the Arctic. After all his years at sea, Zuko was confident he could navigate in the types of treacherous waters Earth Kingdom ships wouldn't think to enter, but flying and landing in such an environment was a new challenge. Zuko had been flying three days now, and after he'd left the last patch of saw land behind him yesterday afternoon, the landscape had changed drastically. Since there was nothing else to land on within his considerable line of sight, than icebergs or the icy water itself, Zuko had eventually figured he had to take his chances. So far, things had gone fine, though. No unintended dips. From what Zuko had gathered, despite their fiery reputation, dragons were good swimmers. It made sense, considering their natural inhabitants of an archipelago. Zuko was a great swimmer in his human form, able to hold his breath unbelievably long if he needed to. So, the reason he was reluctant to land on water wasn't that he disliked water in any of his forms. No, it was more to do with how, just how cold the ocean was. Unlike an air bison, Zuko did not have the thick fur or body fat to protect him from these kind of water temperatures. The air, cold as it was, was more bearable. Large animals could maintain body heat better than small ones, after all. Still, this was far from an ideal environment. Even for his tough dragon exterior, having a long, skinny frame meant Zuko had much more skin exposed to the chill wind than most animals his size, and he had to maintain a higher body temperature in the first place. His dark skin absorbed heat from the sun well, but did nothing in the way of camouflage. Oh, come on, you can do this, Zuko thought, and shook his head a little to shake away any fluffy snow that had fallen on his back. Roku's spirit animal was a dragon, and Roku spent four years in this climate studying waterbending. Pleasant or not, dragons can survive here. There was one feature that dragons had, though, that Zuko found extremely useful here. Big claws. Even before embarking on his journey, Zuko had guessed they would come in handy when hanging on slippy slopes. It turned out they were also useful for other things. Most noticeably, fishing. It had taken Zuko a while to figure out how to catch fish mid-flight, but he had been determined and well-motivated, and had eventually gotten the hang of it. It turned out his instincts did most of the work for him, if he just let them. He was still no expert, but thankfully no one was handing out points for style. During his previous excursion, Zuko hadn't been dragging long enough to start hunting. This time, before he had left, Uncle had insisted he take good care of himself and keep up his strength. Zuko had brought more supplies with him, but they were for emergencies. In the same magical way that the transformation didn't destroy his clothes, the supplies had magically disappeared when he turned into a dragon, but would return once he transferred back into a human. Zuko couldn't access these supplies without shape-shifting, though, so that really was more of a backup plan. Iro had suggested fishing as a less disgusting alternative to raw meat. In all honesty, though, while human Zuko found raw meat unappetizing, dragon Zuko probably wouldn't have minded it in the least. Still, on the Arctic Ocean, fish was more easily accessible in any case. Uncle had originally wanted Zuko to stay at Shara's house until he was fully recovered, but they had soon agreed that neither of them could wait that long. Zuko wouldn't probably be fully recovered from the explosion before the invasion reached the Northern Water Tribe, and Uncle had to contact Zhao even sooner before the invasion fleet left Earth Kingdom. So they had compromised. Zuko had stayed until he was well enough to move around with ease, while Uncle looked up as many maps and scrolls as he could find on the North. Zuko had spent a few days practicing being a dragon before Uncle had been satisfied he could fly all the way to the Northern Water Tribe. Then Aura had sent word to Zhao, as late as he dared without at risking getting left behind, informing the Admiral of his desire to participate. Zhao, having heard of Uncle's misfortune, apparently suspected nothing, had arrived the next morning on his flagship to personally welcome Ira on board. 
To Zhao's credit, he might be an annoying assassination attempting prick, but he wasn't completely brainless. Even Zhao could recognize Uncle's worth as a strategist. Or maybe Zhao just wants someone high ranking around to explain his ambitious plans to. Or, quite possibly, he just wanted the dragon and the rest there to witness how he had achieved his ultimate triumph, something Uncle had failed to do at Ba Sing Se. One way or another, I was now in position to keep an eye on the Admiral. That night, Zuko had begun his journey to the north, preferring to fly under the cover of darkness while traveling past some somewhat populated areas. After the first night, though, Zuko had concluded that the odds of someone seeing him this far north were next to non-existent, and had been more straightforward in his travels since, stopping to rest, not to hide, and only to when he needed to. Zuko looked up. The powerful winds had been blowing all morning, but they were not quieting down. It had started to snow. Small, fluffy snowflakes were appearing in steadily increasing numbers. It was time Zuko continued his flight. Although the iceberg appeared stagnant, it was merely an illusion caused by the lack of anything steady to compare it to. In reality, Zuko knew the sea currents were moving the iceberg south, taking him further away from his destination. It wasn't a good idea to linger. Zuko used the sun to confirm his bearings. Even through the thick clouds and falling snow, Zuko could always tell, without a shadow of a doubt, where his source of power was in relation to him. A very handy skill when traveling long distances, through an ever-changing landscape of snow, water, and ice, with no noticeable landmarks to navigate by. After Zuko was convinced he knew which way he needed to go, he opened his wings, stretching them for a while, and took to the air again. Zuko wasn't sure how far he still had to go, but hoped he was close to his destination. Time was running out, and besides, he seriously hoped there wasn't an even colder climate he had to reach. Sokka steadied his footing and reoriented himself. Not a moment too soon, his opponent next assault was quickly upon him. Sokka rolled to the side to evade the oncoming spear. Still crouching, he swung out his own spear in a wide arc at the other warrior's feet attempting to trip him, but the other young man had time to scramble backwards, just out of his reach. Not wasting any time, Sokka sprang into motion and centered a new strike, hoping to catch his opponent off balance. The hasty attack backfired when Yoki ducked to the side with ease and grabbed hold of Sokka's spear. Yoki pulled at the spear. The moment, the movement combined with Sokka's own momentum caused the southerner to fall head first into the icy ground. A pain shot through Sokka's right shoulder as he landed ungracefully, but he couldn't let it slow him down now, or he would be sure to lose. Unarmed, Sokka improvised. He turned to get to his heels again. In the same motion, he grabbed a handful of fresh snow from the ground. Not having time to assess Yoki's position, Sokka tossed the snow in his attacker's general direction. Sokka was in luck. Sure of his victory, Yoki had dashed forward towards Sokka. The snow hit him smack in the face. Yoki stopped for a minute to wipe it off, but a moment was all Sokka needed. He in turn grabbed hold of Yoki's spear and kicked the other boy in the admin, causing him to fall down. Sokka hurled the spear away. Sokka hurled the spear around and placed it on Yoki's throat. That's enough! Head warrior Kinos cut in. Sokka relaxed and offered a hand to Yoki to help him up. The head warrior walked over to where the two had been sparring. Well done, Sokka! I must say you're up in a choice with a bit unorthodox. For a non-bander, that is. But you always showcase impressive level-headedness and the ability to plan ahead, even under pressure. Everyone here could learn from your example. Sokka swelled with pride. He spent the majority of his time in the war training loose. He spent the majority of his time in the war training losing fights. As much as he had tried to train his skills in the South, with no one there to teach him, he was far behind his peers in almost everything. It was nice to excel for a change. But he cheated, Summer whispered loudly. Kino turned to address all the young warrior trainees gathered in the training yard. When you're a real combat, the important thing is to defeat your opponent any means necessary. In the heat of battle, your basic attacks are your greatest asset, but you must also be prepared to act if they fail. As those of you who have been in our annual hunting trips know, Fighting in the practice ring and fighting a real opponent are two very different things. Turning back to Sokka, the trainer added, But it is similarly two different things to fight beasts and to fight human combatants. A difference I'm sure Sokka here has experienced firsthand. 
Sokka's face spread into a wide grin. Laughing, Kinos added, Not that fighting the Fire Nation can really be counted as fighting people. This earned a ruckus of laughter from the group, but, but Sokka's smile faded. Come to think of it, Sokka shouldn't have felt uncomfortable. He had grown up hearing similar statements. Fire Nation people aren't even people. Firebenders are monsters. People of fire have no soul. That sort of thing. And it was true that the Fire Nation was the enemy, and of course, Sokka hadn't hesitated to fight them off to keep his family and tribe safe. And still, something about the joke made Sokka feel uneasy. The Fire Nation were the bad guys, but they were still human, right? At least the people Sokka had seen at the Fire Festival had looked a little bit like ordinary people. Not even all the soldiers, creepy guys with skull masks aside, were totally bad. Zhang Zhang, for one, he had been a grumpy, unhelpful old man, but he was also an ally. And then there was Ari, the archer Sokka and Ila had rescued. She had been a warrior, and even kind of cool. On the wrong side, no doubt, but not inhuman. In a lot of ways, she was just the war tribe's... In a lot of ways... She was like the War Tribe warriors. Well, if the War Tribes had girl warriors. Hell, even Zuko, the prince of the Fire Nation, who should have, by all means, been evil incarnate, sort of wasn't. Was Zuko an enemy? Definitely. Did he attack on sight? No doubt about it. Evil? Probably. A real messed up kid trying to win his father's love? And isn't that a distinctly human reason to do things? Sokka sighed and shook his head. He couldn't believe he was defending Zuko, of all people. The same guy who busted their village, chased Aang across the world, kidnapped Hyoma and Katara, and, well, sort of defended the Earth Kingdom village from Zhao. Yeah, that had been pretty decent of him. Okay, when did things stop making sense? When did everything become so complicated? Look! In the sky! Someone shouted, breaking Sokka's train of thought. Sokka gazed up, and sure enough, something was approaching. Approaching fast and coming straight at them. Everyone launched for their weapons, struggling to find their respective spears and machetes. Sokka really Sokka already had a spear in hand, but he immediately went for his boomerang, his strongest weapon, which he had left on the other side while practicing spear fighting. Turning to face the sky again, Sokka had to raise his hand to shield his eyes from the sun. What on earth could be attacking them from the sky? He had barely time to wonder when the thing landed on the very yard they were standing in some distance from them. Wait! Sokka shouted. Don't attack it! It's friendly! Sokka stole forward to find himself between the northern warriors and the familiar black dragon. The other warriors still looked ready to launch an assault, so Sokka turned and addressed them. He's a friend. A friendly dragon. The Avatar's dragon. It was a stretch to call this half-wild, part-time ally Aang's, and Sokka knew it. But he had to get it through their sister tribe that they shouldn't attack the dragon. And he couldn't really think of any better or simpler reason why not. The people of the north did not like strangers, let alone scary, fire-breathing strangers. Even when he, Katara, and Aang had arrived, the tribe's policy had been to ambush first, ask questions later. Sokka didn't want to see how well a dragon would take to that kind of treatment. Sokka could claim the dragon was his dragon, but that seemed unlikely. Where would a war tribe boy have gotten a dragon? No, it would make more sense if it say it belonged to Aang. The air nomad was famous for owning unique, supposedly extinct pets. What was a dragon on top of an air bison and a flying lemur? Also, there was more authority in saying it was the Avatar's dragon. Different rules applied to the Avatar. To Sokka's relief, his word had the desired effect. The warriors stopped for a moment. They were still wary, to say the least. Some of them were even furious, but also confused. Are you sure? Head warrior Canus asked, dead serious, not for a moment. Not for a moment averting his gaze from the predator looming near, nor did he lessen his hold on his spear. Yes, Saga hurried to assure. I'm sure. It's Aang's dragon. It's friendly and it's on our side. It has saved me and Avatar it has saved me and the Avatar loads of times. Even rescued Aang from a heavily guarded Fire Nation fortress, and it saved an Earth Kingdom village from a volcano. So you do not need to worry about it, and you do not need to attack it. And it's even true. They had to listen to him. The Avatar didn't mention a dragon earlier. Kino sounded dubious, but he also signaled for the rest of the warriors to hold back. Um, well, 
I'm sure he must have told someone about it, Sokka struggled. Why didn't it come with the rest of you? Kinos demanded to know. Uh, Sokka really didn't like explaining that they absolutely no say in the dragon's coming and goings. Instead, he eyed the thankfully still placid dragon behind him, and it occurred to him to wonder why had a dragon fallen here. Then he noticed that the creature had one of his whiskers lifted. Actually, the dragon has come here to tell me something. I'll know more once I, uh, communicate with it. Just don't attack, all right? I know what I'm doing. Sokka and Kino's eyes met for a split second, and the older man nodded almost impetuously. That was all Sokka needed. He turned to face the black dragon and started working toward it. Hi there, he greeted, suddenly painfully aware the creature had very much understood speech. Well, at least it hadn't thrown a hissy fit being called Angs, so maybe it was going to play along. Good to see you're feeling better. We were pretty bad. We were pretty worried for you. The dragon nodded his head in greeting. Yep, definitely a freakishly smart animal. So, you come to tell me something? He gestured to the whisker. The dragon nodded again and lifted the whisker even closer to Sokka, stopping a few inches from his forehead. Mind link things creeped Sokka out, but this was probably really important. Also, he'd be damned if he left himself look like a coward in front of all his peers. So Sokka took one more step and lifted his hand to touch the end of the whisker. His mind was flooded with images. There were fire and ships. Lots of them. So many of them that they filled the whole horizon, and there was Zal signaling for the fleet to start the moving. Sokka's mind snapped back to here and now. Oh, hell, he murmured, and then looked the dragon in the eyes. They're coming here, aren't they? Another nod. Sokka turned to face the warriors. Um, the dragon just told me the Fire Nation is sending an invasion fleet here. A really big invasion fleet, led by Admiral Zhao. Warriors look stunned, their expressions varying from dumbfounded to utter belief. Yeah, we're really sorry for bringing so much trouble to y on you guys, but I guess we'll all know the Fire Nation is going to do something. I suppose nothing, and I suppose knowing is better than not knowing. Sokka rode the back of his head. He was definitely blabbling again. How? the head warrior asked. After seeing the lost look in Sokka's face, he clarified. How did the dragon tell you that? Oh, right. Well, dragons can show people images through a mind link of sorts. And read minds. It's how they communicate or something. Now as Kino's turn to look like he couldn't understand a word Sokka was saying. Yeah, I know it sounds kind of unbelievable and creepy, but it's actually pretty useful. And I'm not making it up. The dragon can't really talk through mind connection. It's a fire thing. Some human firebenders can do it, too. Firebenders can read minds? The head warrior stammered. Yeah, well... Sokka tried to ex hard to explain himself properly. This fire sage guy we met said it was one of their element's special talents. Kind of like waterbending healing is for us. And it's real. <sighs> ask anyone. Hell, ask Katara. She had a firebender interrogate her by reading her mind this one time. Dragon! Before Sokka had time to do anything, Aang flew to the yard, closed his glider, landed on the dragon's feet, and hugged the creature. Okay, that wasn't the way Sokka would have acted around a predator with huge claws, but at least Aang's reaction was selling Sokka's lie that it was his dragon. Hell, for all Sokka knew, the airbender might actually consider the dragon his, since the air nomads didn't own anything. But in practice, they kind of did. Aang was a pretty screwed up understanding of the concept of ownership. He didn't think he should have any earthly attachments, but he still considered things like his glider, his oppa, and so on and on. So maybe Aang could call the black dragon his by now. The dragon actually snorted, and Sokka could have sworn it rolled his eyes, but it didn't shake Aang off or do anything aggressive, so that was a bonus. We were so worried for you when you just left like that. Aang said, taking some distance to look the dragon in the eye. Now the beast definitely rolled his eyes. It also nudged Aang playfully with a snout and a friendly gesture. Aang laughed a little. Sokka seriously hoped the dragon wanted to stay and would be allowed to stay. He was already picturing some of the impossibilities that would bring his own dragon brought with it. All the warriors will be so impressed, not to mention the ladies. Maybe I could ask Yue to go for a dragon ride with me. Just because she's engaged to a jerk doesn't mean we can't be friends, right? Sokka thought, hopeful. 
Granted, Sokka could also take Yue for a ride on Appa, but a dragon was somehow even cooler. Appa was reliable, like a bulky long-distance cargo ship, but a dragon was a speedboat for flying things. Suddenly, a huge slide made of ice formed itself on the rooftops. On it was Master Paku, and right on his heels, Katara. Sokka had been aware the dragon had been a bit nervous earlier, despite how it tried to play it cool. Just little telltale signs, and at what point did Sokka learn to read those? But now, upon seeing the impressive feet of water bending, the dragon tensed visibly. It's okay, Sokka hurried to answer, lifting his hands in a placating gesture, earning a dubious look from the dragon. That's just Master Paku, Aang and Katara's new water bending master. He's. well, he's an uptight chauvinist, but other than that, he's okay. Mostly harmless. Katara snorted disapprovingly at her brother's description. Boy, those two bonded fast. Just a few days ago, Katara would have used far harsher terms to describe the chauvinist's waterbending master. But now that Paku had accepted her as a student and even taken a liking to her, they were all apparently just supposed to forget his earlier behavior. Sokka rolled his eyes at his sister. Whatever. What is the meaning of this? Paku asked, his tone prickler than usual. Master Paku, this is my friend the dragon. Aang provided easily. Yep. Sokka cut in. He isn't here to hurt anyone, so don't attack him. He just came to warn us about an oncoming Fire Nation attack. Paku's piercing gaze landed on Sokka. Really? And remind me, how do you know a dragon? It's been following us for a while, Katara answered seriously. We were worried at first, but it's been really helpful to us. She turned to face her brother. But what did you say about an attack? Sokka nodded. Oh yeah, the massive invasion fleet heading north, which is now in charge. Suddenly, Master Paku took a step forward and bowed his head in a formal greeting. Everyone, including the dragon, stared, but eventually the dragon responded with a graceful bow of its own. I am Master Paku. It is an honor. The old, usually never this courteous man, introduced himself. May I inquire your name? This was unexpected. So far, things had gone well, as could be hoped for. Not only the foolish airbender, but also his little more... But also his little more sensible water drive friend Saga had vouched for Zuko. And as he expected, everyone presumed Zuko was an animal, a pet, a potentially dangerous animal, maybe even a smart animal, but an animal nonetheless. That foolish presumption was something Zuko had intended to take full advantage of. But now, Master Paku was greeting him like a bending master would another, expecting him to introduce himself, which was alarming. Zuko couldn't help but wonder if the master had realized he wasn't a real dragon. But surely Paku wouldn't be making casual conversation if he had. A far likelier option was that Paku somehow knew what most firebenders did. Dragons were being treated with respect. Perhaps the men had traveled. In any case, Zuko hadn't anticipated the question. The Avatar lot hadn't asked Zuko for his name, not even when they realized he could speak. But somehow Paku knew there was more to a dragon than meet the eye and the old man was expecting an answer. One Zuko couldn't afford to give. Well, not truthfully, anyway. Zuko tried to quickly think of a good name for a dragon. What name did he know? There was Tuli and Ron and Shaw. Avatar's dragon, the Fire Lord Sozai had had dragons. The name of which he had surely been told, but he couldn't remember now. There are a lot of dragons in legends and plays, love among the dragons, which Zuko had seen enough times to remember by heart. But I couldn't pick the name of a known dragon and risk causing misunderstanding. Toph, I called him Flicker, but that was a silly name, even if the Noras bought it. Flicker didn't exactly demand respect. He didn't practically want to connect his mind to Paku's, but he also wanted to convey the meshes to all present. So Zuko reached his whisker down and started drawing characters in the fresh snow. Since the War Tribe already knew Zuko was smart, he might as well demonstrate that not only did he understand speech, but could write and read as well. It was the first time Zuko tried to write while in his dragon form. It required concentration, and his handwriting wasn't as neat as it really would like it to be, but he supposed it would do. Nice to meet you, Cool. Pocket replied after reading the characters. I didn't know he had a name. Aang voiced out loud, and all three children must have been thinking by the look of them. Paku actually rolled his eyes. And why does this not surprise me? He commented, more to Aang than to Zuko. The waterbending master turned his attention back to Zuko. When will the invasion fleet get here? 
Zuko didn't know an exact date, but there was more visible. There were so many variables in sailing, but presuming Zuko had moved the, fl but presuming Zhao had moved the fleet at its top speed, Zuko would give it a few weeks. However, even though he felt sympathy toward the Water Tribe, Zuko was more on the Fire Nation side any time of the day. He didn't want to give the enemy more details than wasn't absolutely necessary to gain their trust. Telling about the invasion had been nothing short of a treason as it was. Although Zuko had learned years ago that sometimes what was treason did not go hand in hand with what was wrong, he did feel a twinge of guilt. But like Sokka said, the tribe had already suspected an attack was on the way. Still, these people would use everything Zuko would tell them to fight his countrymen more effectively. He wouldn't tell them any more if he could help it. If only the Avatar hadn't come here, then maybe the battle would have been avoided, Zuko thought. Even though he already knew it wasn't that simple. Zao had been planning the invasion far longer than the Yabo had known the Avatar was going to reach the Northern Water Tribe. That much had been plainly evident in the correspondence Zuko had found in Zao's office at Pihil Stronghold. The Avatar's arrival had undoubtedly sped up the plans, but a battle would have been inevitable, regardless. Zuko had wondered if he would try to convince the Avatar to leave, or possibly kidnap him again, but that wouldn't be preventing the invasion. Having come this far, even if Zhao heard the Avatar had escaped, he wouldn't hesitate to conquer the Northern Water Tribe just to be sure. Zuko shrugged his shoulders. It wasn't partially graceful, nor a very helpful gesture, but he hoped it would suffice. Hawking nodded and tried to face the humans on the plaza. Chief Anuk must be told of this at once. Master Kinos, would you send your students home and then see to it that our, the council is called to a meeting? The oldest of the soldiers nodded and started giving orders to the youngest around him. Paku turned back to Zuko and bowed his head again. Thank you for bringing us this information. If you would be so kind and wait here while we discuss the matters. Zuko nodded and curled on the ground to emphasize that he wasn't going anywhere. Once again, earning baffled looks from the team avatar. Good, Zuko thought to himself. It wouldn't hurt for those kids to learn just how much further one would go with good manners and by showing respect to all living things. Though, in all fairness, I only learned that lesson a short while ago myself. I probably don't get it to say. Lying down while surrounded by enemies, especially by waterbenders, made Zuko nervous. But he didn't have much choice in the matter if he wanted to stick around, and after the long flight, he really did. He had to first earn the people's trust. This was where Zuko could be of most use, and it would be a real shame if he turned away so soon. Now was not the time to let his suspicions or pride get the better of him. The ground was cold and far from comfortable, but Zuko wasn't big on complaining. Also, he was very much doubted there was any comfortable spots close by. The city was, after all, built on and of nothing but ice. At least as far as Zuko could tell. Despite Arrow's constant reminder that the northern water tribe capital was a powerful stronghold, Zuko had expected to find something equivalent to the village on the southern pole. The actual settlement had impressed Zuko greatly. The northern city was nothing like the worn-down igloos he had seen in the south. The city of ice was quite beautiful, even if Zuko couldn't quite figure out why anyone wanted to live on ice in the first place. Zuko kept a casual look on the avatar and the waterbenders. Master Paku naturally worried him more, but Katara, too, appeared to have advanced greatly in her studies in a little time, and she spent studying under a master. If she kept up pace, she'll be a master herself in a few years. And although Zuko tried to keep an open mind, he couldn't help resent the girl just a little bit for her Azul level of giftedness when it came to learning bending moves. To some people, everything just came easy. Paku was talking to Team Avatar. Avatar Aang, Sokka, it'll probably be for the best if you join the council for our next meeting. A hurt, angry look crossed Katara's face as her not-so-subtle exclusion from the group meeting. But then Paku turned to her and made a very deliberate gesture towards Zuko. Katara, would you be so kind as to stay here and keep our new guest company? Right. Zuko got it at the same time Katara did. If the look of dawning realization on her face wasn't anything to go by. It's not that she isn't allowed into the secret meeting. It's just that I was a suspicious creep and they don't want to leave me without a babysitter. Katara bowed to her master, stating it would be an honor. A logical choice for a babysitter slash guard, really. Zuko thought to himself. The dragon and Katara had met before, and he clearly accepted her presence. 
She is also visibly the least trusting of the bunch towards Zuko, and quite possibly the one with the best chance of matching him in a fight. Not that Zuko thought it was likely that Katara would take him on, no matter how rapidly she had improved. She wouldn't be able to defeat him as a human, let alone as a dragon. Still, it would be interesting to put the theory to a test. Zuko found himself briefly wondering how Katara felt about a friendly sparring match, but now was probably a terrible time to ask. Perhaps after the locals had more of the time to adjust to the presence of a dragon in their midst. Ah, uh, it's good to see you again, Cole. Katara greeted him, making a show of addressing him by his name. Do you mind if I stay and keep you company while the others talk things over? Zuko huffed, showcasing it didn't matter to him whether she stayed or left. All through the conversation, he'd been making an effort to act nice and cooperative. But this level of friendliness was unnatural to him, and it started to wear him down. Also, Zuko didn't want to view as someone completely tamed. He'd rather keep everyone on their toes. It was most honest of things considered. You shouldn't trust me so easily, Zuko thought almost wistfully. Besides, what was the point of trying to befriend someone who, if she knew Zuko's true identity, wouldn't hesitate to dice him with ice at the first opportunity?